One of them wanted to be the security guy. He claimed he was a security guy. Exciting episode of Scary Guy Radio. Now I have a very happen to have a very that was better, Travis. It was you're right. It was better, better on the faith. Thank you. <laughs> very excited to have a very special in studio guest, Miss Tanya. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks now, for having me, Miss Tanya. Know each, and I know each other from a Burbank business group. Yes. And uh, used to do voiceover work. Yes. Back in the day, I did. Yeah. So she came in today, and I said, "Why don't you come on the show and let's let's get some voice samples? It'll be fun." And then I want a different perspective today because we have a really interesting topic which is money laundering in the drug business. Amazing. And I'll bet you didn't know that if we had attacked that aspect of it, maybe a little more aggressively, it had, would have had a different solution. Remember you see these movies where there's like a whole warehouse of money? Remember the Joker mm-hmm. in the Batman show had a whole warehouse of money? That's not fake. <laughs> that actually exists, right? That there's a whole warehouse full yeah. of money sometimes? Yeah, bigger than that. Yeah, well, seriously, right? Amazing. So our guest today is going to talk about that, and I want to welcome our guest, Mr. Michael Hearns. Welcome, Michael. Hey, thanks welcome for having the show. me. Thank you. Oh, Michael doesn't get any applause, Travis. Okay, there we go. All right, very good. So we we hooked up on LinkedIn, I think it was, and I thought, what an interesting background this is. I hadn't thought about the money laundering aspect. Uh, so we'll talk about that extensively today, but I'm looking at your resume here, dude. This is pretty uh, pretty awesome. Thank you. This is like uh, this is like a, a movie resume from Movie Cop. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your background. Uh, well, my background in law enforcement is I did about 27 and a half years in Miami, Florida as a police officer and detective. Um, I'm an ex-SWAT entry team member. I was actually the primary on the entry team. I'm a certified officer, survival instructor, um, graduate of many schools, DEA, Secret Service, so on and so forth. But the big thing was for 10 years, I was undercover, 10 continuous years, an entire decade of my life, I was undercover in the Medellin and Cali cartels. Act and has a money launderer, and also we did major narcotic transactions, but also mostly money laundering. You were playing the role of the person laundering their money for them. Yeah, myself and the guys in my group. Yeah. you know, sometimes we p- played more like a broker, is what we would call them—a broker who moved money through different channels for the cartel. Now, how'd you get into that? I mean, is this something you wanted to do? You volunteered? No. It just came up or what? No, I was actually uh, detached to the city of Miami doing what we call jump out, which is basically like you see on TV with the crack sales and the street narcotics and so on and so forth. And then my agency came to myself and uh, three other guys in my group and said, we want to assign you to U.S. Customs Service Operation Greenback doing anti-money laundering. And I heard that. I rolled my eyes and I thought, you know, I'm not a banker. I'm not a finance guy. It sounded boring to you. Oh, my gosh. It sounded extremely (laughs) boring to me, but it was the exact opposite. It's literally one of the most uh, compelling aspects of law enforcement that you can probably do. It involves so many different facets of investigations and so many different aspects of what you're doing. And, you know, yes, television and movies do portray people being murdered or killed over drug transactions. But the real reason is because of what those drugs represent is the money. Right. So on the money side of things, it is literally just as lethal. So... Did you have to go through, through special training for that or anything? No. Uh, no. What actually happened with me personally, and I can't say this will happen to anybody else, what happened to me personally was a combination of a couple of things. The first thing was I grew up in a small municipality in the city of Miami that was very aviation-centric, right on the airport practically. Oh, like one of those airport mm-hmm. air, air parks where people live and have a plane, that kind of thing, that's small? Well, no, not exactly that. Um Miami, Miami-Dade County is actually bigger by population and geography than the state of Rhode Island. Uh, people don't realize how big Miami is. And it has something like 27 separate municipalities. And I grew up in a municipality called Miami Springs. And Miami Springs is right against Miami International Airport. So as a child growing up, everyone in that town was very aviation-centric. And a lot of these people were involved in different cargo freight 
and uh, transportation of things. And many of these like pilots in my town were ex-Vietnam or Korean War veterans. And many of them missed the adrenaline rush of, you know, that salt spray on their windshield. So sure. they didn't care, even though they were flying for Eastern Airlines or Pan American Airlines, they didn't care in the day off if they were bringing in women's shoes from Santa Domingo or ganja from Jamaica. And my whole town was full of loaders and kickers and transportation guys. And I kind of knew the drug business just growing up. Oh, interesting. So when I got into law enforcement, and then as we asked me to go into the money laundering aspect of it, yeah, we had a couple quick seminars of sorts. But it was literally um, on-the-job training. Like, the police academy does not teach you anti-money laundering. They'll teach you the, the elements of burglary and robbery and traffic stops. But this we kind of architected and, and created ourselves as we moved along. Well, it was emerging and evolving, I suppose. I mean, the drug business, as it grew and got crazy and bigger, this was an offshoot problem, yeah. right? And, you know, you probably didn't have that problem with uh, the gangsters in Chicago back in the day, right? No. I mean, it was, you know... It's it's alcohol, it's it's tax evasion, but they didn't have giant warehouses of money. I mean. No, this was definitely an ancillary aspect of the drug trade. And as we were successful in penetrating the drug trade, laws began to be enacted for forfeiture and seizure. Right. And we began to have more veracity and more bite to what we were doing, and we started having, started having more jurisdictional aspects to our job. We started becoming cross-sworn. I'm I was cross sworn with the Broward Sheriff's Office of the City of Miami, U.S. Customs Service. We all started collecting badges and IDs like Carter's Pills. And um, it just became an entity unto itself. And you were kind of being carried by it and also steering it at the same time. Now, you were deep undercover. Yes. Does that mean you really had no contact with anybody for two years, friends, family, that kind of thing? Not so much that aspect of right. it with the friends and family part of it, but definitely – there were, there were actually, to put it to you this way, there were actually people in my 170-member agency who had never seen me for like three years and had no idea who I was. Well, this is the part that, that makes me really curious, actually. This, okay. is, this is the part that's really intriguing to me because um, it feels like you, you, know, you took on this aspect, you became an officer, you carried the shield, and then all of a sudden you're undercover and, and you're, you're literally with, with these people who are breaking the law. And I'm, I'm wondering how it is that you were able to to uh, ingratiate yourself in that and become part of their culture without giving up your oath or integrity or... Yes, yeah, so you're almost whiter than me, I must say. Almost. <laughs> almost. <laughs> almost. Almost. Now, show that, show that picture with the uh, the mullet he had there. From <laughs> the ago. mullet, yeah. See, well, there we go. I get there you are back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, you're going to defend yourself and say that's not a mullet. That's not a mullet. Tanya, what do you think? Is that a mullet? You're, well, well, by not the way, in the you know, Joe Durant sense to of see, things. I would need to see the side view, really. See, and he you're said never it was going all, to. Yeah, he said it was all one length, just kind of combed Well, back, Michael, so. what you don't know is Tanya is a salon operator. <laughs> there you go. Salon owner. Knows the hair business. Past life, yeah. yeah. So, you, so you're, gonna, you're not going to go full mullet on that. Okay, that's fair. You're an expert. I, uh, but I'm guessing that that's like, you know, like I said, early 90s, maybe, you know, a, a lot of men had that do going it could be a wwf kind of a kind of a hairstyle too but i mean you you still look like a regular guy there and that's cool you don't you don't look like a drug dealer uh, or somebody who's passing along briefcases of cash so this is what cops do everybody we make fun of each other am i wrong about that no you're right about now, that if I didn't make you're fun not of wrong would, you're right i wouldn't love you if i didn't make no fun no of all we do is rip each other if we if we didn't get along we wouldn't be doing this all right so back to tiny's question it's a good question um i have always looked at police work and maybe you have a similar view is it, it you're really acting Okay. Yeah. In a way, and you with have no to, rehearsal. No rehearsal. You have to adapt your ability. You have to adapt your sound and your look and your presentation to whoever you're talking to to be most effective, right? So I, I was never very uh, big. I was like you know 160 out of the police academy, so I couldn't beat you into the jail. I had to talk you into the jail, right? And you come up with ways to say things, how to say it, how to ingratiate yourself like that, and that's what a good smart cop does. And so I don't know that I could translate that into undercover because I, lying just makes me go. I just, I'm hard. I'm a bad liar, right? So you have to be a professional liar, too, to do that. It's, it's not so much a liar as much as you're adopting a persona. And you're also, everything most of us do in life, especially in law enforcement, is very tribal. You know, you wear a certain uniform. Right. You, you have a certain language. Well, the drug world has its own language and its own quasi-uniform as well. And you just learn that language. You learn that that ability to communicate at that level. Um it helped that I had the background I had growing up. Sounds like it, yeah. And it also helped that you, you recognize it's kind of like, I tell people it's kind of like being in a hurricane. 
you know, when you're in the center of the hurricane, it's calm. Okay. Everything's swirling around you. It's when you step out of that center that you recognize all this this hub rub. It's just moving all over the place. So it was probably more difficult for people in my life than it was for me because I was doing this on a day-to-day basis, whereas they were seeing all the other intangible aspects of it. Right. But was it one of those things like you couldn't come home for a while? You know what I mean? Like it wasn't that you couldn't come home. So sometimes you're so busy you didn't get home. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, yes, I, I always changed my route each day. I went home a different way. You, you clean yourself as we'd call it. You check your mirrors, you pull over, you wait for traffic to go by. There's different things you do. Sometimes it was hotter than others. Sometimes the day went by rather routinely. And then sometimes it was rather intensely. Um, you just kind of learned to adapt and move in that environment. Oh, nope. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Chuck. Uh, during that time, was it was it one of those things like there was a whole decade? So were you were you just logging uh, activity, or were you actually making arrests during that time? All of it. I mean, uh, I was Miami based, but we always carried a suitcase in the winter time of winter clothes. There were times when, you know, you would wake up in Miami and go to bed that night in New York. Wow. And you had no intention of being in New York. And right. that happened to me one time. I came out here to L.A. a couple of times. I had no intention of being in L.A. And so, you know, I met a guy for breakfast in a seaside restaurant in Miami and ended up having dinner on the, uh, at the Pierview restaurant, which is no longer around in Malibu. No intention of being in California right. that day. So your persona you adopted, um, kind of a, a banker-like kind of a persona, uh, the money mover guy, mm-hmm. the guy who touches the money. What was the persona? What? You're, you're, you're more like a broker. Okay, broker, right. And what the broker does, you see, they call it the parallel exchange, or they also call it the black market peso exchange. What happens is the people who control the drug trade oftentimes live in a geographical part of the world that does not use the U.S. dollar. They use pesos. But the product they're putting out creates dollars. So you come in as the guy who collects the dollars and helps them get repatriated back to South America in the form of pesos. No, that's interesting. I, I was under the misconception that these big warehouses of money uh, were useful because nope, they, they could are. just take it and say, I'm going to go buy a yacht for American money. But the end goal is they are, – are you saying they wanted to look legitimate at the end? That was their, All their, three. That was their ultimate goal? All three. They want the U.S. dollars because around the world, the U.S. dollar is still king. Right. Mm-hmm. And the U.S. dollars also buy things that are highly treasured in the rest of the world. Um, Levi's jeans, Marlboro cigarettes, Johnny Walker scotch. That does real well in Eastern Europe. So even though you're a South American drug lord, you oftentimes are have these tentacles that go around the world. So yes, you do want what they call in Spanish a caleta, which is basically a large stash of cash. But the other aspect of it is you want that cash to buy that yacht, as you mentioned. But you also want that cash converted into pesos, because in your home country, you can then buy your fincas, your houses, taxis, taxi service. You can own a radio station. You can do all kinds of things through pesos. So you want all of it. You want the pesos. You also want the stash of cash. But you also want what that cash can buy you worldwide. So the money uh, to buy your local radio station or local Walmart, if you're trying to launder legitimate, legitimize the money, uh, Am I hearing that there's some legitimacy in the government down there that <laughs> they really do want to try and make it legal by saying we're not going to take your dollars, you can only buy pesos? Or does everybody really know that that's all a bunch of baloney? It, it's not so much that it's a bunch of baloney. It's just that that their standard of living and their economy is peso-driven. So a legitimate businessman who wants to open up an Apple computer store right. in Bogota is vexed because to buy computers in the Panama free trade zone, he needs dollars. But all he has is pesos. The drug trafficker in South America has a stash of dollars stateside. So a person like me would come in, take the dollars from the drug trafficker, buy the computers in Apple, get the guy's store stocked, take his pesos, and give the pesos to the drug lord. Oh, interesting. So the conversion is made. So it becomes almost an economy under an economy, an underground economy. So for the layman, which is this girl right here. And um, me at one time. (laughs) uh, Does that mean then, you know, you buy the computers, you set up the guy with the store, he pays you the pesos, you give it back to the... So is then the money considered clean? 
Yes. Is that okay? Yeah, well, that's so then, at, at that level. Yeah, <clears throat> it, it can go even further in the, in the cleaning process. And we wouldn't always do something like that. Sometimes we would have a third party just give a corporate check or something. But that, in a nutshell, and in, in, you know, in a in a in a Cliff Notes version, is kind of an ex, an explanation of the black market peso exchange. And that's totally illegal to do that, right? Because you're taking money from what was inevitably bought and selling of of illegal products and right for something services. to be considered money laundering, the money has to be derived from an illegal source. Derived from, okay. Now derived the guy with the Apple source. computers is he in trouble? No, he's not. He doesn't because always know. He doesn't always know. All right. You know, he's not. The example I give people all the time to try to explain money laundering is if I bought marijuana from you, okay, and then Chuck says to me, um, hey, I, I really like that, that, that watch you're wearing. And I go, yeah, you know, I got it from my brother in law for 100 bucks. I can get it for you if you want one too. Now I get the 100 bucks from my brother in law. And I pay you for the marijuana. And then in turn, Chuck gets the watch. You've kind of cleaned that money. Mm -hmm. You know, Chuck doesn't know that the watch he got came from the hundred dollars that came from the marijuana. Right. So he's out of the equation as far as any culpability. But you and I know where the money came from. Right. And so that gives, in this particular case, me uh, plausibility and you saying hey you know uh, because i got it from you it's it's on it's illegal on your end but chuck is safe and sound right he's right? safe and sound because he doesn't know where it came from you and i know what that where, what derived that money from so here here's what i can never get my head around with all this kind of stuff if uh if, i've never taken a drug in my life but i've worked around drugs i was you know on some little mini task forces and we would do little buys and minor stuff, nothing serious, right? Like motors, most. But what if you were expected to, Chuck? Like, what if you were in an environment where they were like, "Hey, you know what? This is this is La Familia. This is what we do." Like, oh, I could act my way out of that for sure. I, I, yeah? I could jump in and become one of the family. I get that part, but I don't know if I could sustain it because eventually I would just it just would bug me and I get bored or something like that. <laughs> but here's what I don't get: I don't think I could. Uh, if you said, uh, "Chuck, I want you to go out and buy a." a what is it? You know, a bag of marijuana today. I don't have any idea where to go find a bag of marijuana. What I don't get is how you can pop in there and say, "Okay, let me go find this guy that wants to launder some Apple computers." How does all that work? I mean, that's just kind of well, Dade County, right? I mean, they- no, but how do you how do you get into the where does the loop start? There's the question, right? So you're obviously undercover, and you probably don't have a rolodex of people that want to launder money when you go in there, right? So does does that motivation come from the drug guy that says, "Okay, listen, I know this guy that wants to buy something." Is that where the connections come from, or do you make up your own connections? It, it's a chicken and the egg environment. What happens when you start off is you usually have a stable of informants. And once again, we started out in the U.S. Customs Operation Greenback Task Force. So we kind of inherited some of their informants okay. and then enhanced and then also grew with those informants as well. And you don't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to be in the money laundering broker business. Exactly, right. You need to have collateral or credibility. Most times, if not all times, you need to have collateral. And collateral can come in a couple ways. One way would be that we are able to show the cartel that we have ample funds ourselves. And if we are going to move your currency for you and we lose the currency due to a seizure or some other mishap, you can tap into our funding to recoup your loss. Well, that's your insurance. Yeah, you need that. Okay, that's the first way. The other way is you put up some other type of tangible product. It could be a large estate home somewhere or something else. But what oftentimes happens and what people don't seem to realize is that oftentimes what's collateral is a family member. And if I lose your money, you can Mm -hmm. kill my sister. Oh, I wouldn't like that role. Who was your sister? Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) A fake fake persona, fake sister. When these people, you know, this people, Hollywood and and, and the motion picture industry oftentimes portray money launderers as these meek, bespeckled, suit-wearing guys. Yeah, the bean counters, yeah. No. Interesting. It's a whole different environment. So you're a badass mofo. Uh, I don't know about that, but you... <laughs> or you play you, a badass mofo. <laughs> you have to have a certain edge to you because it's it's the end game. Sure, sure. All the, the processing of coca, the, the transportation of coca, the, 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 the creation of it, the coca ball, 
uh, the jungle labs, the bribery, the corruption to get it into the United States, the street sales, the large-scale sales, all of that's negated when you seize the currency. The end game is to get to the currency. Yeah, everything stops flowing. There's no money. I mean, right. you can try and poison the crop, and you can try to do a lot of other things, but it's not as effective as just saying, hey, there's no money to buy your stuff and keep it going. That's the right. engine. You can do all the crop eradication you want. You can do all that stuff, but that's, you know— it's not going to happen. I mean, I think at some point the United States offered Bolivia something like in the 1980s, something like $3.4 billion for crop substitution. They said no because it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Yeah. Now, if you're offering up your sister as, as this persona, uh, am I hearing that you have to be, well, you have to appear to be equally as ruthless as uh, some of these guys you're dealing with? You're dealing with money. Kind of on the alpha male level, you're kind of like just as equally a badass as this guy is. And you, you screw me. I'm going to screw you back, right? Yeah. Okay. You're, de- you're dealing with money, and there is no room for for any type of leeway of um, malfeasance. I right. I mean, you know, uh, the sister thing is oftentimes the actual true brokers who are out there doing it oftentimes go into that extension, you know. Um, it's all about trust. Here's the irony. It's all about trust. And credibility. Trust and credibility with inside a, a completely criminalized organization, right? So trust <laughs> – we talk about this in the show right, all the time, so, how important s- trust is. Right. So that's the other thing is like I, I understand that from some of your – when you were young, you grew up in kind of that area. You knew people that were flying in and out. They didn't care what it is, so they kind of saw you around. But how how do you build the credibility to say, hey, I, you know, when when really what you're trying to do is is crack all of that? Here's, here's the analogy I take. So I, I have 13,000 people on LinkedIn, right? And I get all kinds of invitations all the time. And I just kind of know not to take one, no matter what their profile says, by the way. Because, I don't know, my intuition says, you're too familiar. You're overly familiar. I don't know you. You're asking me to go into some business venture. You know, those are obvious ones, right? So you just, like, pop on the scene and say, oh, here's this, uh, this guy that's got a lot of money. He's in the business. And where did he come from? Well, you know, he's been around 20 years. Well, I can't Google his name. What? You see what I'm saying? That's what I'm trying to get. Well, you know, you 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 made a you you made a reference to the American mafia earlier, and in the American mafia, when you're dealing with mobsters, you know, there's a certain language. And if I say to to her, if I say, "Here's Chuck, he's a friend of mine," that means you can't talk around Chuck. But if I say, "Here's Chuck, he's a friend of ours," that means you can talk around him. Oh, it's the code. Okay. So what happens is you start out with these informants. And you begin, the informant starts to vouch for you because what's happening is... Oh, they're already in the club. They're, they're already in the club. Right. And the informants are making, let's, for argument's sake, we're going to make the math really simple because I'm not really good at math. <laughs> <laughs> for argument's sake, say there's $100,000 to be moved and the informant's going to make, you know, 6% to move that 100000 We will offer him 8% if we make a seizure. Oh, okay. So his job at that point is for that inducement is to try to get us into the club. Yeah. And then once we're known to be in the club, we start to take over some of these contracts. You don't just wake up and say, I'm going to move money today. You have to bid for it. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. And you bid on the contract to move the money. If you're moving money, like we moved a lot of money through New York. If you're moving money out of New York, it's a higher it's a higher percentage because the distance and, and the different entities of law enforcement that could be in between you right. know, in Manhattan and Miami. When you're moving money in Miami, it's another point system. So everything's done on points. So you bid for these contracted jobs to move money, and then you start to – once you start to successfully push money through, so you, you have to – this is where the rub kind of comes in with law enforcement. You have to let a little bit of the money go, go down. I would think so, right. To establish credibility so you can try to recoup it later on. And we call it uh, the ratio movement. If you're moving currency, it, say it's $5 million. Your goal is to seize $5 million, but you might have to let 300000 or – maybe even 400000 get through the system right. to show credibility. Pay some people off on the way. Yeah. Well, just, just to show that you're— Just do deals, right? Right, yeah. just to show that you're, 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 you're able to make this work. And then hopefully you can seize the other $4.6 million or something down the line. So that, that ratio, you're doing well. But if you start moving at a one-to-one ratio for every dollar you seize, a dollar you launder, or a two-to-one ratio, you're really not part of the solution. You're part of the problem. So when I made a reference earlier to— uh, the Batman movie. What was, what was that? It was, what was the movie? The famous one. Um, you know, with the... Yeah. I remember you made the reference about the Joker. The Joker, yeah. Guy. Heath Ledger was the Joker, right? So yeah. there's a scene in there where he gets... The Joker gets all the bad guys to get in this warehouse, and it's a warehouse, a pyramid full of money, 
that's like, you know, 15, 20 feet tall. And when I talked to you prior to the show, you said, that's nothing. No, it's not. I yeah. mean, give, I, me some, I, give me some idea of scope. On I, I remember before I was in law enforcement, um, I had friends of mine who were in, in sort of in the business. And they were telling me that uh, they told me that they knew um, Fabio Ochoa and that he at the time in Miami, this is like 1977, 78, he had three or four people working full time counting currency in a house in South Miami Dade County. And I thought, that's unheard of. Right. Um, I have literally seen money on pallets. You know, that's, I've seen situations where what they'll do is like the ones and fives are so cumbersome that what they'll do the first time is they'll just weigh them. They'll count them. Right. Get an accurate count, which is tedious as all get out. Sure. And then they will weigh it. And from that point forward, they just weigh the ones and fives and they give an estimate. Interesting. Because it's just too much time and effort sure. to, 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 to do, to you know, are, you know, to count them all. Well, that's interesting too, because they always say it adds up, right? So, well, so it's like, yeah, ones and fives they get weighed, and and maybe there's a few dollars that fall off here and there. I mean, that that becomes that, that's that's like you tens dropping of thousands. a couple pennies in the couch cushions of your couch. You know, to them, yeah. yeah. Give me an example, and this is the law: one kilogram of cocaine equals three kilograms of cash. <laughs> that is the law. Wow. No, you know, the sun's coming up tomorrow. The moon's coming out tonight. That's the law. Okay. So when you hear about the Coast Guard, you know, off the coast of Colombia, um, seizing 100 kilograms of cocaine, that would have been, you know, 300 kilograms of cash. Wow, that's an interesting But what's the denomination on that, on the bill for that? Well, it's interesting you ask that because I'll give you another example. Um, We've all seen, like, the price for gasoline. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll see a price for credit. And sometimes you see a price for cash. Gasoline's right. priced on taxes and futures, though, right? Isn't isn't it similar to pork well, that's hedging. Or, when, you, okay. when, you, when you when you when you hedge, you know, uh, uh, when you hedge a, a commodity like gasoline, you can do it on the futures. Okay, but so this is different. As you're driving down, you know, uh, Melrose or something out here in LA, and you see a price for cash and a price for credit, why do you think there's a difference in the credit card price versus the cash price? Uh, merchant fees. Merchant fees, the factoring fees of, of the credit card being used, the convenience of the credit card being used. Okay, you're right to a point. But what happens is all of your known street narcotic havens in any large city, and in Los Angeles, we can, I'm not going to you know, denounce any neighborhoods, but let's just say. It's not Burbank. <laughs> not Burbank. <laughs> now, carry on. <laughs> Those people selling street level narcotics are not going to Colombia and getting kilograms of cocaine and cooking them in the rocks. Those kilograms of cocaine are being brought to them and they're being fronted based on projected sales. So a cocaine wholesaler will go into a neighborhood and drop off five kilograms of cocaine in one neighborhood and five kilograms in another one neighborhood and five in another one. So he's got 15 kilograms out on the street. And he tells the crack dealers, I'll be back in 45 days. You pay me then. So that crack dealer is going to take those kilograms and cook them in the rocks and sell them. But what happens is many people who are using street-level narcotics are on the downside of their own life due to their addiction and their use of drugs. Mm -hmm. So they're reduced to borrowing, stealing, begging money from friends and everything else that they can. And many of these people go into neighborhoods that they don't traditionally live in themselves. So they're ripe to be ripped off. So they take the money and they roll it up and they stick it in their pants. They stick it in, the, in, in their upper cheek of their gums. They stick it underneath the flip-flop of their shoe, down their underwear, all kinds of things. And what happens is they end up buying the crack cocaine with these ripped, torn, nasty ones and fives. <laughs> now, we talked about one kilogram right. equals three kilograms of, of cash. cash. So all of a sudden now... The crack dealer is going to keep the best bills for himself, the 20s and 50s that he can ever accumulate. But he's going to give the crack, the cocaine wholesaler, 45 days later, all these ripped, torn, nasty ones and fives. <laughs> You'd think the wholesaler would be like, hey, you know what? I don't want, the, I don't want these well, he nasty. Doesn't. He doesn't. So what does he do? Bills. He goes to the guy at the gas station. Let me ask you something. When you buy $17 worth of gas and you give the gas station attendant $20, what does he do with that $20 bill? He puts it under the till. Okay, why? Because he wants to save that. It's a, it's a higher currency, and maybe it's a better-looking bill, too. True, but many people think it's because he doesn't want to be robbed. Right, safety. Yeah. But the reality of it is we all know that a robber would just grab the till. Right. 
But Chuck's right. You're, he's hoarding the large bills. So now the cocaine wholesaler's got 15, no, he's got 45 kilograms. Of cash. Of cash. All ripped torrents ones and five. <laughs> so he goes to the gas station guy and he goes, hey. I just have this visual. <laughs> yeah. He Stinky goes, bills on he goes, And money is filthy. He goes to the gas station guy and he goes, hey, I'll give you 92000 I'll give you $100,000 in ones and fives if you give me $92,000 in 20s and 50s. Oh, there's still a little laundering going on at that level. I didn't realize that. Exactly. Interesting. So it's have, that's why you see this. That's why the gas station guy is trying to induce you to buy cash. Because he's going to not only is he making money but selling that gasoline, that implies that every gas that no. every gas seller is in on the is in on the laundering and drug trade. I the, mean, it, it doesn't imply that they're all in on, in on it, but it gives you a barometer of where to start looking. And there's other businesses that would do this. I would sure imagine. I mean, pizza yeah. places, yeah. hair salon places, anything that's cash intensive. Marijuana clinics. I bet you they have clean money in marijuana clinics in Hollywood, <laughs> especially with all the. Well, actually, you wealthy write, people. Well, marijuana clinics have a problem with their cash. Yeah, because they can't it. bank it, right? They can't bank it. Yeah. And so that's that's a curious question that I have too. It's it, it, what what would have happened if we had just not said say no to drugs? What if we had just said, you know, let's let's let Bolivia work out their own stuff, and if it comes in, then you know, it's none of our business. Maybe we should make it all legal, like alcohol after the prohibition. Would would we still have the cartels? Do you think that that would have existed anyway, or would it be at the level that it is now? In theory, I mean, in I, I, theory, know. it'd be saying, "What if we told Apple not to have computers in every household? If you allowed the cartel to, with impunity, just flood our country with cocaine, there would be well, cocaine saying, in every household." I'm saying, what if we made it legal and taxed it like cigarettes? You know, it sounds like it's run like a business now. Very much like a it, oh, it is yeah, yeah. And, and I think you may have the it same is. issue with it is, the but there's no anything. infrastructure with that. There's just there's, there's just an people. internal infrastructure. They have their own infrastructure. Well, th- yeah, they've got houses and yachts and stuff, but you know, there's well, still potholes well, on the five think, freeway. If you think about it as a distribution model, it's pretty remarkable, actually. It's an amazing distribution model. Yeah, and not only that, not only is it an amazing distribution model, but the Colombians who controlled it for decades upon decades were actually controlling a product that doesn't traditionally grow in their country. Most of your coca grows in Bolivia and Peru. Right. So they were able to get, you know, coca from another country and control the distribution of it into our country. And then you saw the rise of the Mexican cartels because for years the Mexicans were moving cocaine into the United States and being paid in currency. And then they started saying, listen, pay us half in currency, pay us half in cocaine. And then they became oh, you know, their own distribution center. Well, but it is an amazing distribution center. Yeah, well, what's interesting about Mexico, from what I understand, of course, I, I, I don't know anything about this stuff, right? Um, but it's it's that they would say, pay me half in cash and half in drugs, and then they would cut those drugs with other things, make it double, and then go out and sell it the same way that they would as if they had gotten the whole barrel in just drugs, right? So they were able to double the amount of cash that they were bringing in. And that was part of the problem um, when it came to people being poisoned, Having having stuff that wasn't, not to say the drugs aren't poison anyway, but as far as uh, the the toxic stuff that you talk about, the the kids dying on the street, um, getting bad product, mm-hmm. um, and I I don't know how you would st- I mean I don't know how you even stop that. How do you, how does that how do how do we how do we help to 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 keep it off the street then in that case? I mean, if you made it legal, one argument is that demand would go up. I don't think so. I don't know. I, I think people might try it once in a while and think it's okay, but I, I'm not taking drugs whether it's legal or not. That's a philosophy thing. Yeah. I don't know. It's hard to say. Yeah, I had an idea. When I was in Culver City, we would stop people once in a while. Um, one guy was speeding down Slauson. Just a simple traffic ticket. I didn't think anything about this guy. Stopped him. What he stopped me for? You know, gets the toed. And so when he gets the toed, you know he's doing something wrong. Am I looking at your trunk? Oh, no, you can't look at my trunk. So I look at the registration. Well, this car isn't registered to you. It's registered to somebody else. That's my friend. Well, you have no standing, so we open the trunk. A bunch of kilos of cocaine, machine guns, all this kind of stuff, right? And I thought to myself, what if we took something and did something with the money, right? Because money is what drives it, to your point. It's all about money, and that's where you're most effective in your job. And I wrote a letter to the Treasury and the President. Or that's when I was very idealistic. I thought <laughs> I could do something, right? And I said, I got an idea, guys. Why don't you make some of, these, some of this money on this, uh, you know, change the paper currency so after six months 
it starts fading out, and you have to always have new money in the system, and you have to exchange it all the time. And so those warehouses full of money in a year are just going to be useless. And, you know, because it, you know, I'm talking about like a photo sensitive, something like that. And uh, nobody wrote me back on that idea. Although <laughs> I thought it was a good one. I don't know. I mean, it was about the money I thought back in the 80s. That's what I thought. Yeah, money. That's why we get up in the morning. I mean, you know. It's a driving force of every economy in the world. Yeah, my buddy found a, a little toilet bag on the. He was on patrol and found a toilet bag on Washington Boulevard and had uh, like fifty thousand dollars cash in it. Probably fell out the bottom of a car or something. There was a lot of stuff going on back in the eighties. Sure was. Yeah. Now was that kind of your heyday? Um, my heyday was actually the late eighties, all all into the nineties, as far as law okay. enforcement. As far as a Miami resident, yeah, the eighties were a booming time for Miami. Right. You know, I mean, if you weren't in the business, you were definitely uh, profiting from it back then. The restaurants are full, hotels are booming. That much, man. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, I mean, once again, go back to the one to three ratio. When you think of it, and that scope. Yeah. You know, you ever get into an airplane, look over the landscape, and see those houses and buildings. There's a lot of commerce going on in the world. Right. So, tell me how you would handle a seizure. Like when you would decide, okay, let's take that money, let's grab it, let's interrupt it, because I'm assuming. <laughs> If I did a couple transactions with you, and if one winds up in a seizure, I'm going to get a little suspicious. Yeah. So how do you time all that stuff? Yeah, yeah. We call it the once removed law. You have to set up these um, situations where you start to separate yourself from the currency. So if I were to um, meet you and pick up some currency and move it for you, and now you want me to move more currency— I would probably try to get out of that contract and say, I can't do it. My banker's fat. The, the, the phrase would be fat, which means my right. banker can't handle it anymore. My banker's fat. I can't handle it right now. And then uh, we would have a surveillance team watching you. And then as you went to go somewhere else, we would try to get you once or twice removed from me before we made the seizure. So he's going to go down the road and do a couple of the deals with other people. Yeah, that money has to get moved somewhere else. So he's going to try right. to sell, sell it to another contracted broker to do it. And at that point, you try to intercede on that level. Oh, so you're seizing the deals that you're not involved in through yeah, surveillance you're, 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 and stuff. You're taking enough in to yeah. give yourself credibility, but the idea is to find out the root issue, where it's coming from. Where's the stash house? Where's this all coming from? Are you, going to, are you a bottom feeder? Are you a main player? What are you going to lead us to? Right. And that's how we kind of had this hierarchy of, of people that we deal with. Now, how many people are trying to launder money? Because in my brain, what I would have thought is, if this is, you know, El Guapo's, uh, is that the right word, El Guapo? If, that, if that's his area. The handsome one, El Guapo? What, didn't they call one of those guys El Guapo? Was El Chapo. El Chapo was a, all right, yeah. Oh, they call him Flaco Guapo, whatever they call him, yeah. They're, <laughs> they're all have, on the end of it. All we, right. all have, we all have names. <laughs> all right. El Mulato, you know, the mullet. <laughs> <laughs> so... You know, if that's his, uh, that's his neighborhood and his territory, uh, aren't you always dealing with his underlings and his people who are trying to move the money? Yeah, but they, or is it that many customers, the different customers? Well, it's not so much customers that these, these, these minions kind of factor in and out. There's so much currency to be moved that, you know, there's, there's a group of people who just push it through the banking system. There's another group of people that buy capital goods. They'll buy 50 washing machines. Okay. And they'll send 48 washing machines down to Columbia, but two of them will have all the guts taken out and be lined with cash. Right. So they'll use the capital goods not only as a vehicle to get cash back to South America, but they'll also use it as buying products down here that they can turn around and resell for pesos. So there's a many different ways to do this. So there's all types of people involved in the business and different ends of it. So you're not running out of customers then? On, if, no. On your no, side of it. They're not running out of customers who are using the narcotics, and right. we're not running out of customers who are moving the money. And okay. are you are you making deals for credibility? Like, do you do you make an arrest, say, and it's like you were, you were talking about the code before, like he's a friend of mine or he's a friend of ours. And then you go out and say, well, um, you know, we busted you now, and I need, a, I need to be in a friend of ours conversation and you're going to get me there? Or do you do you just process them, let them go, serve their time, plead their case, do do all of that, and just leave it alone? I mean... Well, you know, a lot of times um, the, the opportunity where you keep hearing back and forth is just no meal. It's not mine. So what happens is, like Chuck had talked about, the Slauson traffic stop a couple minutes ago, mm -hmm. they don't show any standing. We try, or I try, to convert them into informants, into working with us. You know, and if they don't want to, then they need to explain how and why they had money seized. 
That's not a good conversation no, to have. No, no, good conversation. No. I'll give you an example. We had a guy in the early 90s who we were watching. We knew we had picked him up on surveillance. We knew that he was in the business. And we had so many targets that it was like literally we'll get to him when we can. <laughs> wow. So all of a sudden this guy shows up and he comes to um, U.S. Customs in Miami. And he says, he voluntarily says, I want to be an informant. Hmm. And we're like, oh. So we sit down with him, myself, and two other guys. And for like 45 minutes to an hour, he starts telling us all the stuff he can do for us, how he can get us in on the inside, and he can move currency and move, you know, percentage and everything else, and what percentage will we move it for him. And we figured out what was going on was he was moving currency for two different people. And two, two dealers, maybe. Or, two dealers, yeah. Drug yeah. De- lords or whatever, yeah. And he was skimming <laughs> from the first guy. Uh-oh. And then when the first guy called him on it, he started skimming on the second guy. To pay the first guy back. To pay the first guy back. Pyramid scheme. So now these two guys eventually figured out independently, this guy's skimming from us. So what did he do? He came to us hoping that he could turn us on to a third target, recoup from his seizure, uh, the money we'd pay him for being an informant, right. and pay off these two other guys. <laughs> So we called him on it. We called him on this BS, told him, and, you know, I remember his eyes got big as saucers. And I said, listen, you live here. You drive this car. Your kid goes to school here. He was amazed that I had all this information right. on him. And we cut him loose. We didn't deal with him. Uh-oh. And about four, five, three weeks uh-huh. later, he uh, he fell out of a seven-story Bogota hotel room. Now, why didn't you make a deal with him? You thought he was blo- making Because he was just gonna, he was just going to burn us, too. You know, well, you, get, you have to understand that, that a, a guy like that is is these people are money mercenaries and they have no loyalty to you. They have right. no allegiance to you at all. There's no God and country and patriotism and oh my God, I'm gonna do the right thing. They will sell you out as fast as they'll sell out somebody else. Right. You know, this is not um, a business for the faint of heart. I, I would be suspicious that someone came to me that I didn't pull in and find right because right. You, you could be setting me up because uh, the big the big shot wants to know who you are and he's going to run right back right. to him. Well, that's what I would have Well, assumed. like I said, yeah. though, 3 to 4 weeks later, he wasn't around anymore yeah. anyway. Ah, oh, man, Jarvis, what do you think about all this stuff? It's amazing, huh? Did you have learned anything? It's amazing. All right. Now, tell us what you're doing in the private sector business now because you're you're consulting on all these things. Why? Mm-hmm. I'm thinking and I read a little bit about it in the background, but do businesses still have to guard against this? Do they have to f- be able to identify that this guy that wants to come in and buy a thousand Aeron chairs here, a thousand bucks a piece, he's probably a drug dealer, not a legitimate business? I mean, is this where your focus is now? There's there's a lot of focus going on. You know, um, many financial institutions are getting slammed constantly for FDIC fines and such for not having any type of rigid or tight controls or anti money laundering compliance. Right. And unlike Certain peoples in the certain peoples. There's my English. Certain people in the field. I actually did it. I actually, you know, stood on street corners and picked up suitcases full of cash. And I do understand the money, the money laundering business. So I've worked with certain banks. I've worked with certain regulatory uh, casino commissions and such, helping their personnel understand um, symptoms, signs, traits of money laundering. Why a money launderer would choose your business? Why a money launderer would choose your your city? Um, certain things lend themselves, and I've also done a little bit of consulting on in the motion picture business. I just did a, a movie in uh, Norwalk, Connecticut, a little small independent film. So there's a lot of things that are going on. Um, it's slow. It's fast. It kind of has its own pace, and we just go with it. Are the private businesses um, either complicit or completely unaware of these things? I mean, I think you'd have to be a little complicit to, for the guy to come up and do this. Am I wrong? I don't know. Or the ways the bad guys can sneak the money in and try to fool the bank? No, it's according. I mean, there are certain financial institutions that literally will say to themselves, hey, we'll get hit with a $7 million fine, but we'll also be able to recoup our bottom line by $75 million. Oh. There's other people who are very, you know, uh, guarded about doing the right thing the right way, and they need people like myself to come in and help them understand the money laundering business. It's, it's, it's a lot more varied. I hope that this, the discussion we've had so far has been able to uh, shed some light. That's a lot more varied than just straight out suitcase for suitcase, handshake for handshake. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's it's a regular it's, business. It's deep. Yeah, and and it's diversified too. Yeah. What's the uh, what's the most dangerous case you've had where you felt this is it? I'm um, 
going to see the angels. Or maybe you never got to that level of, uh, of threat. Hmm. Although I would always feel someone's trying to kill he me. He seems pretty smooth. I don't know. I, you're paranoid. Uh, well, that's good. You know, I, I, I good don't point. remember. I remember being in, uh, I was in Queens, New York a lot. And I remember, I remember like you would sit down. You needed to have like immediate accountability. You come in exactly. from you come in from Miami, and all of a sudden they're like, "Hey, we're from the Brooklyn DA's office. This is Charlie, Tom, and Fred. They're going to be your backup today." And you're looking at these guys, and you're saying to yourself, "Okay, I'm going to pick up two hundred fifty thousand dollars from Jackson Heights. I don't know these guys. You know, they could take their own car, park it at the New Hampshire Canada border, and I end, I end up in in fifty thousand hot dogs. You know, I you mm-hmm. know I don't know these guys. You mean you don't know these guys? I don't know the cops. I Meaning the I don't cops, know the yeah. bad guys. Oh, interesting. All right. So you really don't know who you can trust. In our business, we always said the same thing over and over again: trust no one. Right. So it's not like you're turning your back on your brethren in law enforcement, but I don't know what your situation is. So a lot of times, like, like if. Like across from LaGuardia Airport, there's a street called Dittmer Avenue, and there's a large row of hotels. There's a Marriott, there's a Crown Sterling, there's a couple of hotels there. But people don't recognize that there's also a, a pedestrian crosswalk over the expressway right back to the airport. So sometimes after making a pickup of cash, I would tell you know the backup guys, I'll be there, and I'll be with you in a second, and I would ditch out the side door and go across to the, the um, pedestrian crosswalk and get to the airport and call them on the cell phone and go look. Uh, I'm already at the airport. We're cool. You know, I'm, I'm done. Um, so if you ask me what was the most hairiest times, it's learning to trust people that you don't know who are supposed to watch your back. And they would tell you things like, hey, you know, last time we picked up some money from this group, the undercover got shot. So don't worry about it. And you're <laughs> like, well, okay. you, know, you know, here I am up in, the, in this frigid northeast. And it's not where I want to be, you know. And why did you decide to get out? It wasn't so much a matter of deciding to get out. Um, I think... Ten years is a long time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the needs of the agency started changing. The perspective of the agency started to change. And uh, it was just a good time to move on. So we talked about this in relationship to drug deals. What do you know about the relationship to terrorism? Does it work any differently when the terrorists are trying to no, you know, no, buy, ter- ter- sell Netflix CDs or whatever they're trying to do? You know? No, terrorism financing is all rooted in money laundering. Right. Or it's also rooted in, in, in contraband, too. Like she mentioned earlier about the, the possibility of kilograms of cocaine being stepped on with added um, impurities to, to lengthen right. the, the cocaine. You know, one of the biggest things that terrorists use is contraband goods. And one of the biggest part of that is baby formula, you know, because babies can't tell you it tastes bad. Mm -hmm. So they'll counterfeit baby formula and flood the market with that and then make currency out of that. Um, A lot of terrorism financing actually comes from the third currency in the world. The, the biggest currency in the world is legitimate currency. Right. Ford Motor Company, Toyota, um, you know, Coca-Cola. The second currency is drug trafficking. But the third currency is groceries coupons. Oh. Really? Shame on you, Groupon. Shame, shame. Yeah. Really? Not, not Groupon. Gro- coupons. Grocery, grocery store coupons. Look at how her eyes popped up. Yeah. Man. That's yeah. incredible. What do, what do how does that work? We need to oh, it's, yeah. it's, really, it's really amazing. Um what like I just see little old ladies coming with like, oh, I want my 50 mm, cents in my rain no, check. No, no. With the grocery coupons, what happens is, especially in the Northeast, we have these small bodegas and small markets that are often uh, owned and operated by certain ethnic communities. You have to send your grocery coupons through one or two clearing houses. One of them is A.C. Nielsen. Yeah, I knew yeah. that. There's only a couple of them. Right. Yeah. Right. And the big tip off is when the coupons start coming in from stores in like UPS or FedEx, because if they send it U.S. mail, it becomes a federal offense. Oh, oh that's but right. It, but yeah. they're mail private fraud. shipping. Yeah. So yeah, what, clever. what they'll do is they will actually go out to like these um, newspaper distribution centers and steal the Sunday flyers in the right. Sunday newspaper, all the coupons, and they'll hire... Um, elderly people, college students, single mothers, people who may be behind the economic power curve to clip coupons. And then this little market that never does anything all of a sudden starts redeeming, you know, thousands of dollars <laughs> of a certain coupon. And then those coupons, those checks come in from the clearinghouse. 
they then get repatriated overseas. Look at look at Jarvis. He's on Pinterest I, yeah. and he's looking at his Groupon account, aren't you? This I is, can tell you are. This is fascinating. I had no idea. I wouldn't have guessed in a million years. I would have said ten other things before coupons. Yeah, the actual first bombing of the World Trade Center was funded from grocery coupon. Uh, that terrorist strike was funded from gro- grocery coupons. And there it is, a security guard exclusive a, from a Brooklyn video store. Yeah. Amazing. All right, yeah. so what kind of money are we talking about with with coupons? And and let me, let me get. I don't use coupons. Um, maybe I do. I don't know it. Well, you know, you got your Ralph's card, right? I mean, they kind of give you a discount. Um, so I take a coupon and it discounts my uh, your loaf of bread. Loaf of bread, and I save uh, I save a dollar on it sometimes. Maybe save a buck. Right. The store is saying, "Hey, Mr. Bread Maker, give me that dollar back that I discounted, or maybe give me seventy five percent on it, or what the, do they the, do?" The store takes the coupons that you you give them, right? Sends them off to the clearinghouse. The clearinghouse validates that coupon is accurate and then sends the store a check. For the full amount of the discount or a partial? Um, they must keep something that makes money. Obviously, there's different I mean, factor and yeah. methods, but you know, some of them are full, some of them are partial. But there's a reason. It, it, the, the idea of the coupon is to get you into the store to not only buy that product, but to buy other products. Right, right. right. So then what happens is you know, you're talking about a Ralph's or a Vaughn's situation here in California, but what we're talking about in the Midwest and in the Northeast are these small little stores. Okay. And all of a sudden, you'll see an uptick in grape juice or an uptick in, oh. in Lysol or some other product. And that's like the red flag to – there actually are task forces that look into this type of type of stuff. Now, are these are these counterfeit coupons or legitimate coupons? There can also be counterfeit coupons. But most too, legitimate. Them. Most of them are legitimate. And like a, they'll, they'll go to like a newspaper drive for like the Boy Scouts and they'll dive into the dumpster and grab all the right. coupons they can. They'll, they'll, they'll steal them or buy them from newspaper vendors. They'll hire people to collect them. And they just cut them and send them in, and they give them a little percentage, but the big bulk of it comes back to the store, and then the store repatri- repatriates the check in either through their account or through a dummy account back to a terrorist organization. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, that's like the, I, I uh, do a whole hour and a half of this when I when I lecture a whole yeah. hour and a half on just this alone. Well, this is I mean this is uh, kind of like the uh, you see the people at uh, the Empire Center up there collecting money. I have a child. I haven't fed the child. I need money for my kids. Those can be. You're talking about they're standing out. They're standing yeah. outside at, at, at like these giant shopping malls that, right. or strip malls, and with a sign, or they've got a child. And it's or, the same child. And the child has a beard now because well, when we started this ten years ago, it was smaller, <laughs> but it's the same lady, right? <laughs> and so what happens is that they they she's one of maybe a hundred people like that, and there's one guy that runs them from you know usually a uh, compound. Well, but I think I think that's a, a maybe a, a gypsy scam or a Slavic gangs or whatever you want to call it. There's all these kind of connections to these different type of gang elements, right? And that guy can make $100,000 a year off every one of those yeah. girls. Well, you know, it's like a it's a that human coupon. It doesn't seem worth doing though. I mean, No, but then that? you multiply this it's 100 times 10, but there's there's thousands of these people that can network, right? So when when the guy's taking the coupon and little store gets his check back. What, what are you talking about? Can you get ten thousand back a year, twenty thousand a year? What is it? Well, I mean, if you and I know you have spent some time in Manhattan and other cities like that, think about those little cafes and bodegas that are on every street corner. They're busy, yeah. And think about what. Yeah, there's like secondly, a, yeah. The but how, how do you get the buy-in from all those small businesses? Are they strong-armed into doing this? Yeah, yeah. A lot of them, a lot okay. of them are strong-armed. A lot of them are paying off debt to be brought into the country. A lot of them are being paying off debt to have that store. And a lot of them are being strong. Or what about security, right? So isn't that, I mean, that's a, that's some, I know I'm talking Hollywood, right? This is just what you see. Somebody comes in, trashes the place and says, I'm going to be back unless you have a certain amount sure. or unless you do something sure. for me. No, I no, mean, that's how. I that, got that straight out of television. That's how Meyer Lansky met Lucky Luciano. It was that, that exact way in a candy store in New York on Hester Street. Um, the way you combat this, and I'll ask, I'll ask the both of you, of you this. Have you ever opened your Los Angeles Times? And I try not to, but occasionally <laughs> I have to. Chuck. <laughs> and uh, you, see a, you see a product in the coupon that you really want, but you've never seen it in the store before? Right. Yeah. 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 Well, sometimes what, the, what A.C. Nielsen, U.S. Postal Service, Secret Service, will do is they'll create an ad campaign, and every store that redeems that coupon that product doesn't exist. Oh, interesting. You know, that's crazy because I did go into a store once and I was like, where's this Starbucks drink? And they were like, if it were, it'd be on like aisle two or whatever. You go there and it's not even there. So it's a red herring to identify fraud. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes like like certain cities, like for for years, Columbus, Ohio was the number one place to test market products. 
Procter and Gamble and yeah. Colgate would do stuff there. I could and see you that. might find a product in the city, but most times if there's something out there you've never seen before, there's a real good chance that it's it's like you said, a red heron to find out what stores are gonna redeem it and then they know they have coupon fraud going on. So I guess you have to make it legitimate, uh, because otherwise Nielsen's not gonna write you a check. They're gonna look for fake ones. You know? Yeah, I would guess so. You were telling me a, a really interesting story before the show, and it's not money laundering per se, but it's all part of the how clever people are. Tell us about the uh, the points scam for hotels. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, these guys did – this was not illegal. Not illegal, right. No, the, you have to, like, give these guys credit. I, I actually envy them. I'm pretty <laughs> – pretty, uh, you know, I worship these guys. They're pretty cool. <laughs> Some guys in Texas or something, they – um got together, they had some pretty high credit ratings and they got all their credit cards together and they purchased from the Franklin Mint all these Sacagawea coins. One dollar equals one dollar. And so the Franklin Mint would send them these Sacagawea coins and then they turned around, put the coins in the bank. Deposited them. Deposited yeah. the coins in the bank, legal tender, paid off their credit cards. And each time they kept racking up high charges on a credit card to paying it off in 17, 15, 18 days. Oh, but those credit cards points. have points attached to them, and travel they, points. And they kept they kept expanding their credit um, ability, so they kept buying more and more of these coins, and they kept getting more and more credit card applications, and they kept buying these coins and dumping them into a local bank. After about two years, this little area of Texas was flooded with these coins, but these guys were living off the points. They were in the GMAC credit card. They were buying cars. They were going on four and five star vacations and cruises and groceries and everything else. All for free. All for free. It's brilliant, isn't and it? And this is not illegal. Not, not illegal. illegal. Well, no. it no. might now they put some restrictions on it. Probably they guess. have. They have yeah. since then. But no, it's not illegal. You're buying and dollar for dollar. Who wants to put the Who wants to put the restrictions? Is it the Is it the credit card that does, or is it the Sacagawea salespeople? I, 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 is it I the, couldn't tell you. But if I had yeah. to guess, I would say that the people who run all the point systems are like, hey, wait a minute, you know. And plus, the Sacagawea coins are really, you know, the the local economy was just full of these things. <laughs> Nobody wanted these things. You know, it's like you know. That's why we went to pay. That's why we went to, to fiat currency. We went to paper currency because it was, it was a chit system back in the day. It right. was easier than carrying gold bullion, you know. Yeah. yeah, easier than carrying coins. Yeah, unbelievable. Well, have you learned something today? This has been fascinating. We, we always learn something on the show. Yeah. It's amazing. Michael is like a plethora of knowledge. Truly, you know what I mean, Thank absolutely you. amazing. Yeah, really incredible stuff. Now, give us your website, how we can get a hold of your phone numbers, whatever you want to tell us. Uh, I'm on Twitter, laundering money on Twitter. I'm also. That's not a good handle. It's, well, you know, it well, yes, serious question. It's do you get do you get some illegitimate inquiries? Oh, in the beginning, I did. You know, <laughs> in, the, in the beginning, I used to get all kinds of stuff, where like from Gambia and Uganda yeah. and, and <laughs> Uzbekistan and stuff, asking me things. And in the old days, you could track your stats on the websites, and I would get views from all these different hotspots around the world. <laughs> you know, yeah. no, and the website is laundringmoney.com. Laundringmoney.com, right? And okay. I'm also on Twitter at laundringmoney. All right. Yeah. And you do consulting with businesses. You go out and give lectures. Casinos, and lectures, um, motion picture motion picture consultation, all kinds of things. Excellent. Anything involved in this aspect. See, everybody focuses once again on the pure drug trade, you know, the Halliburton suitcases being traded in the back alley. There's a whole much more to this. I've got something coming up on the on the Vice Network. I'm not even sure when that comes out. Sometime in the summer. Oh yeah, the new yeah, yeah the yeah, new channel. Love yeah. Vice. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen never it. even seen. No offense to myself, I've never seen it, but it's coming out. Uh, yeah. Yeah, my son watched that all the time. He thinks it's fabulous. Yeah. It really yeah. is. It's a great. It's a you would you're going to enjoy it. Well, You'll I hope so. I did there. something for him about two months ago. So. Excellent. Michael Hearns, LaundryMoney.com. Thanks for tuning in. Miss Tanya, thanks for coming on Security Guy Radio. Thanks for having Good me, Jeff. Fun? Yeah, I had a great, great time. Excellent. Thank you so much. Tune in next week for another exciting episode with my partner in crime, Mr. Jarvis. There he is. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>